So uh, throughout this presentation, I will briefly present the results of the genome-wide association study of IgG glycosylation, as well as transferring glycosylation, which is mainly done by Ariana Landini from the University of Edinburgh, and also her study on rare variant associations of IgG and transferring glycans. I will also uh, present some brief results on the epigenome-wide association study of IgG glycosylation. So when we talk about regulatory network of protein glycosylation, we do know that it really involves a really dynamic interaction of hundreds and hundreds of enzymes and small molecules which form this very complex pathway in glycan biosynthesis. We also know that it is a non-template driven process, so there is no clear recipe in how glycans are specific glycan patterns are formed in uh, various uh, proteins. So our efforts are put into understanding you know, what factors, what specifically genetic factors are involved in this process. So for IgG glycosylation, for which we know has an um, two N glycosylation sites as well as uh, FAB glycosylation sites, we know that all like uh, <coughs> factors such as genetic factors as well as epigenetic layer <coughs> A regulation is also involved, and there is also a big part explained by the environment. But in our efforts of understanding the genetic uh, background, uh, we are utilizing the approach called genome-wide association studies, and this is a widely used tool into exploring the human genome in order to detect these uh, candidate genomic regions that might be involved in various processes and also shaping a phenotype. In our case, we are interested in IgG glycosylation patterns. So as I said, we are using genome-wide association studies, which are by the definition of National Institute of Health, a study of common genetic variation across the entire human genome, which is designed to identify genetic associations with observable traits. So basically, what we are doing in this approach is scanning through the genome and then uh, uh, actually statistically testing the association between the phenotype and also the SNPs or, or a different kind of variation in the genome uh, to see oh, what genomic regions are associated. So we first, here's just a quick uh, kind of, just a workflow how it's usually done. So we start either by already available cohort or we, uh, we collect the cohort, and then blood sample is collected, which is also used for genotyping, but also for phenotyping uh, measurement, phenotype measurement. In our case, it will be either UPLC or LCMS measurement of IgG uh, glycans. And then uh, data processing and quality control is done, and once we have the clean data, we will test the associations between variants and our phenotypes. Because we are testing millions and millions of SNPs, the best way to kind of represent these results would be this Manhattan plot where on the x-axis we have SNP uh, genomic coordinates and on the y-axis we will have minus log 10 of the p-value. That means upon the transformation of the p-value, the smaller the p-value is in the genome-wide association study, it will appear as higher peak in this Manhattan plot. Uh, one good thing about genome-wide association studies is that we can easily do the meta-analysis of several genome-wide association studies. In that way, we will increase uh, the sample size that we have, but also increase statistical power to detect novel associations with our phenotype. And as previously mentioned, genome-wide association studies are hypothesis-generating approach, so we are not necessarily testing hypotheses, but rather exploring the genome to, to find these candidate genes, which can later be uh, used in hypothesis testing approaches such as uh, functional studies in vitro or in vivo models to actually prove that this gene indeed has this function in, in, our, uh, in, our, uh, in this pathway. So as I said, due to the, this kind of um, uh, opportunity to kind of meta-analyze these genome-wide association studies from various cohorts and with accumulation of samples that have been analyzed throughout the years. We have uh, already uh, five genome-wide association studies of IgG and glycum published. First one now 10 years ago in which the associations with glycosyl transferase and enzymes were found, but also additional loci. And over the course of the years, we have um, 
And with all of these papers, we see more and more loci, some of them do, which do have an apparent role in a glycosylation pathway and could be associated, for example, with, uh, with the transcription of glycosyltransferase and enzymes, but some of them simply do not really fit into the uh, picture, so we are still also trying to understand in what way they might be involved in the IgG glycosylation pathway. And here uh, I will actually just uh, present the results of the uh, latest IgG and glycom GWAS in which we uh, include around 13,700 uh, samples and we find 42 associated regions across the genome. And in this case, the, our phenotype was actually uh, uh, the percentage of structures that contain a certain sugar units, such as, for example, percentage of fucosylation, just uh, percentage of structures that contain core fucose in, in, in their structure. So uh, here we start with uh, preparing the data, calculating the de uh, derived trace that will be used in the genome-wide association study, and then we did the cohort-wise genome-wide association studies in, in, uh, in this case, uh, uh, in seven cohorts of European descent, uh, for which we used HRC imputed SNPs, which would be on average around 10 million SNPs per each of the cohorts. We, of course, take into account genomic kinship and relatedness in the cohorts uh, uh, to kind of avoid this, kind of their, their effects in our uh, associations. And uh, gene, once we had the GWAS uh, per cohort, we did the quality control that would enable the meta-analysis. So in this, as I said, we had around 13,700 samples, and we detect 30 novel associations in comparison to the previous genome-wide association studies. And then, of course, as with any GWAS, we needed to replicate our uh, results in around, uh, we did it in around 7,000 samples and then replicate either the, the top SNPs in the regions or the ones that are with LD in, with these SNPs. And majority of our effort was also put into post-GVAS analysis now, doing the gene prioritization because uh, the majority of these actually uh, variants that we detect are found in non-coding regions. So it's really, sometimes it might be really hard to connect a genome, uh, the SNP with a certain gene. Uh, so there is a lot of effort put into understanding what, uh, what, this, uh, what gene this SNP might be actually tagging in this region. So here I will just show you the, the overview of these 42 loci uh, with 82 uh, prioritized genes based on all of these uh, different um, mapping um, strategies. So as I just here in, in, in orange, you can see, of course, the glycosyl transfers as enzymes, but also we do prioritize a gene, for example, in this a region on chromosome 4, there is a um, MAMBA gene, which is a beta manosidase, another gene which has a, a known role in glycosylation uh, process. There is also an association with SPPL3 gene, which is an enzyme which cleaves the active domains off of the glycosyl transferases, such as uh, B4-GALT1. So it's also kind of uh, one additional kind of factor that might be controlling the levels of active glycosyl transferases enzymes in Golgi in the process of IgG glycosylation. Of course, it is involved, but this is the first time we are kind of seeing it in our genome association studies. And we also see a, a locus for immunoglobulin heavy chains also now uh, kind of <clears throat> showing the, the <clears throat> importance, uh, potential importance of the levels of the, uh, of, of the um, uh, heavy chain um, parts <laughs> uh, for, for the proper glycosylation formation. And when we put these into a genome, a gene set enrichment analysis, we, we see, of course, the enrichment for glycosylation pathways, which is, uh, which is um, already expected, but we also see the enrichment in BNT cell activation and proliferation and transcription regulation. This might also indicate the importance of the levels or, or the proliferation of cells that might be pr producing uh, a specific, like glycan, uh, IgG molecule with specific glycopatterns. We also see enrichment in the genes uh, involved in the ER to Golgi transport, again indicating the importance 
of the levels of, of the enzymes and substrates in, in the cells in the glycosylation pathway. Uh, this is uh, uh, one additional GWAS which was done separately from, uh, from this uh, diff uh, previously presented genome association studies, uh, but here I, we focused on FAB glycosylation, uh, which we could only analyze in cohorts that had UPLC data available. Uh, we had around 8,700 samples, and the FAB glycosylation trait was uh, calculated as the sum of, the, of these structures uh, here, shown in red. And what we see indeed here, uh, besides the expected association with ST6-Cal1, which is cell transfer resistance enzymes, as, a, as also you can see all of these structures uh, contain the sialic acid, uh, we also see associations with MHC region on chromosome 6. However, at this point, it, it, it would be really hard to, to point to specific genes uh, that, that are involved. But we do see that there is indeed a, 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 a genetic control in the FAB glycosylation pathway. There is also this one novel association, which we see for the first time in all uh, both IgG transferrin or plasma uh, GWASs is the association with AFF3 gene on chromosome 2. So this is a putative transcription factor which is preferentially expressed in lymphoid cells and it has potential regulatory role in lymphoid, lymphoid development. And it's been also associated with rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and a lupus. And it's also been shown to be deregulated in uh, cancer. Uh, there was a group, uh, there is a group who, pub uh, which publi who published this paper mid of last year on uh, this uh, particular gene. As they were uh, really interested in it, they were looking uh, for genes <coughs> which might, uh, which are known to be uh, expressed in lymphoid cells, but they don't have really clear uh, function. So that was their mission with this paper to find a specific gene and go deeper into characterization of it. And what they've shown is that AFF3 regulates the class switch recombination by controlling the mutagenesis of switch regions to the recruitment of AID. AID is an enzyme which is involved in somatic hypermutation, gene conversion, and class switch recombination of immunoglobulin genes. So this really indicates that indeed AFF3 uh, uh, just shows the potential of it being involved in the IgG glycosylation transferase uh, <laughs> glycosylation uh, uh, via these uh, processes. However, they did not really kind of go deeper into understanding the exact mechanism by which AFF3 is actually doing this. So it just also gives an indication that this indeed might be a really important factor in, in the FAB glycosylation. Uh, here, uh, I will also uh, just tell you a bit more about the transferrin uh, glycosylation and the GWAS on, on, on it. Uh, we know that transferrin is an iron-binding glycoprotein which is produced mainly by hepatocytes, and it's, it, it has a, a role in regulation of free iron levels in biological fluids. What we also know is that it has two N-glycosylation sites which have been used in diagnosis of congenital disorders of glycosylation, alcohol abuse, and hepatocellular carcinoma. And indeed, uh, this year, uh, the paper was published on the method which is used to quantify the uh, transferring glycans. And this method is based on the ultra-performance, ultra-high-performance liquid chromatography, which is based on HILIC interactions and fluorescent uh, detection. And uh, it was applied to the cohorts of Viking and Corchula. With this method, uh, they are quantifying 35 uh, glycan structures in transferrin. And then Ariana from the University of Edinburgh used this data to run genome-wide association studies of these 35 transferring glycans in these two cohorts, and she found 10 loci <clears throat> to be associated with transferring glycans. When doing the same GWAS, uh, using the same samples in the GWAS <clears throat> of IgG glycans, uh, Ariana uh, now has observed some of the uh, glycosyl transferases um, 
associations that are unique either for transferrin or IgG. In transferrin, there is an association with MGAT5, ST3GAL4, and B3GAT1 enzymes. However, in IgG, there, there is association with ST6GAL1 and MGAT3 enzymes here for sialation and uh, bisecting Glocknac, uh, uh, respectively. But what, uh, what was interesting to see is that uh, there is this shared association, actually not shared association, but both uh, of these genes were seen in, in transferring in, and IgG is the foot eight and foot six for core and anterior fucosylation uh, respectively. And when doing uh, further like in silico analysis, what was found is that, for example, in the region of foot eight, these associations are not shared between, uh, between the, the, the glycans, so between the transferrin and IgG uh, glycans. So the patterns of associations in these regions are different for transferrin uh, glycans and IgG glycans, which is also shown here by this high, really high posterior probability of this hypothesis tree. Hypothesis indicating the, the, the presence of the association in the region, however, not sharing the same causal variant. The same applies to the foot six um, region, with the posterior probability being uh, almost uh, as high as with foot eight. So what could this be kind of um, indicating? It indicates the potential kind of uh, tissue-specific regulation of fucosylation in um, fucosylation because we know that transferrin is produced by hepatocytes and IgG is produced by the B cells. So uh, what has, uh, what uh, Ariana also uh, has shown is that this variant which is associated with a transferring glycans is also controlling, might, is a uh, controlling the, the binding of HNF1-alpha transcription factor, uh, which was uh, previously also shown in the previous GWAS that is controlling the foot 8 uh, expression. And also in the uh, protein, this variant in IgG uh, glycans uh, has also shown to be associated with binding of Icarus transcription factor, which, has, which are both kind of tissue-specific transcription factors, also indicating like tissue-specific regulation of the same enzyme uh, for, for these two proteins, transferrin and IgG. Uh, I will also just briefly present the results of the rare genetics variants um, testing in IgG and transferrin. So with uh, GWASs, we are mainly focusing on the common variants in population. So the ones that are either, like, depends on how you define it, but let's say more than 1% of the population, because uh, we would not have enough statistical power to detect these rare variant associations uh, in, in our current setting. So we are kind of ignoring these rare variants and only studying the common ones. However, there are methods in which these rare variant associations uh, can, can be um, tested, and indeed, uh, Ariana has used the exome sequencing data from Viking, Orchids, and Korchula by uh, then testing the cumulative effect of the rare variants in the gene. So uh, it is done on the per gene basis rather than looking into a specific only like uh, variant, uh, variant based testing. And indeed, what she has found here uh, is five genes uh, associations for transferrin and four genes associated with IgG glycans. As you can see here, a majority of these were already found in the genome-wide association studies such as FOOT8, uh, FOOT6, foot MGAT3, CLO transferase, but also uh, some of the novel and uh, interesting associations such as the RFXAP gene. Uh, this gene is a part of a, a regulatory factor X, which is a complex involved, um, uh, in, it is involved in the synth synthesis of regulatory factor X together with RFX5 and RFX-CANC. 
Indeed, this gene, RFX Kenk, was also a, a hit in previous genome-wide association studies uh, by, by Kladich. Um, and here, uh, what is known about this uh, factor is that it is involved in expression of genes coding for MHC molecules, which we know are important in the activation of B cells uh, to produce antibodies, uh, so their activation by T cells. And uh, I will also briefly mention just the results of the epigenome-wide association studies. Um, actually, one study that we've had uh, in ORCID's cohort. Now, it, the, the method, methodology is quite similar, so now instead of testing the association with SNPs in the genome, we are testing the association of our phenotype and the, the levels of methylation at uh, CPG sites across the genome. So we are testing the association with 850,000 uh, CPG sites in, in the human genome. And uh, here what we see in the sex stratified EVOS is that indeed there are some associations that are sex specific, one of them being the, this association here on chromosome one in the CPG site here, uh, which is present only in females. Uh, when looking, and it's the association with galactosylation uh, phenotypes, and what indeed what we see that this, uh, this CPG site is found in the close uh, here, uh, in proximal to ESR1 binding motif, and we know that ESR1, uh, um, it is a transcription factor which is uh, regulated by estrogen, and we know that estrogen is also involved in, in, um, in control or ha has, has a potential in controlling of, a uh, potential role in control of IgG glycosylation, specifically galactosylation. So this would be something that would be interesting uh, to explore uh, further. However, I do have to kind of uh, note that these are not uh, replicated uh, results, so we, there is now the effort to kind of go into replication and then uh, also potentially, hopefully, functionally uh, test uh, these associations. As I said, uh, we, we would uh, want to uh, replicate these findings we could do, what we could do, improve statistical power by including more samples. As I said, this is something that can be easily done in genome-wide association studies. And also, uh, G, both GWAS and EWAS are hypothesis-generating approach, so there is always a need for functional follow-up. Uh, from, you will hear more about this uh, from uh, Anika, she's our next talker. So testing genes and their effects on protein glycosylation in cell culture uh, system. Uh, and I would like to thank the teams and participants in, in all of these uh, cohorts and also uh, our uh, funding um, agencies. Thank you.